In this episode of Cruising the Solomon Islands, I explore the wreckage of a World War II plane in the jungle, go for a chill sail, have a scary coral experience, this is really scary, get dragged behind my boat underway, discover some truly remote anchorages, search for manta rays, I don't think he knows where the mantas are, and enter a coral pass with no charts and only someone up the mast as a guide. Last week, I left Russell Island. All right, I'm getting ready to leave Russell Island and sailed overnight to Morova Lagoon. Morova Lagoon is the largest saltwater lagoon in the world. The people speak the Morova language and live mainly by subsidence agriculture and fishing. The men from Morova are famously skilled carvers, creating and designing beautiful wooden carvings from ebony, rosewood, and kerosene wood. After a rough overnight passage, I arrived at the pass at 7.45 a.m. It's 7.45 and I'm coming up on the little pass to get in. The next day, I met up with the guys on Uhuru to explore the area. There's an old World War II plane wrecked in the jungle that one of the chiefs told us about, so I jumped in the Uhuru tender with the guys and we headed over to check it out for ourselves. One of the chiefs told us a story about what happened when the plane crashed. This is generations ago, but he said it was when his grandfather was a really young child. The plane crashed into the lagoon and all the locals came out in their outrigger canoes and they paddled up and they rescued two men, I think, from the plane and brought them into their village and sort of took care of them. And then over the years, the planes just kind of crumbled and disintegrated into the jungle, but a lot of parts of it are still there. It's amazing finding these old World War II wrecks and being able to just explore them without any limitations. We spent about half an hour on the plane before the mosquitoes sort of <laughs> started to feast on us and then dinghied back to the boats. The next day we planned on moving further north in Morovo Lagoon as we were slowly making our way up towards the top of the Solomon Islands. So today um, we're moving from this anchorage here up to here I think up to here it's 10 miles uh, and this is a really cool double reef so we're actually gonna go out and then um, sail up inside this reef to get to this anchorage because otherwise you're going through all of this stuff uh, so what I'm gonna do first uh, this is kind of pretty intense it's like the Tuamotu's level um, passage planning stuff with all of the coral. So first I'm just going to make a Navionics route. Okay, so it's actually 13 and a half miles. Um, so it's going to be like this. And then because there's so much coral, what I'm going to do is go into this app, Offline Maps. It's only available on Android, unfortunately. Uh, but there's <laughs> the best anchor, our map is only available on iPhone, so you kind of get what you get. But if you have Android, this is what it is. It's kind of annoying for downloading maps. You can't just mass download an area. You have to go through and like zoom in and pull around to download everything. But um, this will be my route out. So I'll go out and around this reef and then over this. This is the shallow sandbar area. And then um, look how cool this. I mean, it just looks. It looks fake. <laughs> and then up this middle reef bit, which actually looks pretty clear of coral. And then up to here. So I guess it's going to be another shallow entrance and then over here. So I'm going to draw a route on this one as well uh, in purple. And it looks like I need to download these a little bit higher definition. And then I'll use both of these to do my navigating up. If I took the inside route, it would just be ridiculous and probably add a lot of miles but this I mean, this is such a cool lagoon look at this whole area it's just wild <laughs> there's so much coral there's so many islands it's really really beautiful so this is the route that I've drawn I have a track from coming in here that gets me from here to here so that's why I didn't bother doing that so I'll just follow the track out and then I drew this little purple line that I can just follow up between 
the reefs and then the only tricky part was once I started looking uh, here. So this is where I want to anchor, um, but it looks like this reef kind of extends pretty far out, so I think the soonest that I could cut across would be about here, because that's when the water color starts to change. Um, oops. Because you can see that here it's really light and that looks like a lot of coral, so that's the only unknown, but I think that's probably what I'm going to have to end up doing. And then I'll just go back in here and anchor there. And now this anchorage, if I can tuck all the way up in here, will be protected from every direction, including a little bit of south. Um, so that's pretty cool, and this is it in the context of the Greater Solomons. Hello! James is, uh, over there. On the other boat, yeah. Yeah, of course. See you! Alright, I'm coming up on this little lip that I have to go over again and I just want to film the depth sounder so you can see how it goes from super super deep to super super shallow and then back to super deep again. I've just turned off the engine. I'm only going about three knots, but it's dead downwind. I just have up the head sail and I've kept the sunshade up. It's really chill. Um, just a small little swell coming in. I'm playing guitar. I have nine and a half miles to go. And if this is all I do today, I'm really happy about it. Super easy. I've got the tiller pilot on because the wind vane, as we know, doesn't like to work around land because the breezes are all over the place. Sailing within reefs is stressful because of the bombies but in this case it's a double reef so I'm in between so there's no bombies it's a big deep channel I don't even know I think I'm in hundreds of meters of water right now so yeah just being here enjoying the sail <laughs> Radio. I'm coming up to the place where I'm going to cross over that narrow little bridge. <laughs> As I'm getting close to it, I'm getting nervous because in the satellite chart, I can see that there's sand and there's coral. I really wish I could have someone on the bow who would tell me where the coral is and sort of how to navigate around it because I'm not sure how shallow the coral is. So instead, I'm going to have to zoom in really close on here and just hope that everything is okay. It'll go really slow, but I have the wind at my back, so um, yeah, nervous. <laughs> okay, I'm going for it. Um, I can't see anything through the water. It's totally cloudy. So all I'm gonna be doing is looking at the depth and looking at the satellite charts. All right, I've gone into neutral and this is the part where I'm crossing it. Okay. Neutral because the wind is pushing me. 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 170 feet to go until I'm across. Still at 20, 21. There's a bomb on either side of me now. We're up to 30. All right, and I think I'm across. Oh, scary. I don't want to say that wasn't so bad yet because it might still get bad. <laughs> okay, I'm definitely going over some coral now because the depth is jumping all over the place. All right, I think I'm coming off the other side of the shelf now. I'm up in the 40s again. This is gonna be hard to get motor 
and rotor against the wind to get into our anchorage. Hopefully it's flat. The wind's kind of from a shitty direction. A lot of coral on the bottom here. Depth is just jumping all over the place. That was definitely harder on my own without someone uh, looking out on the bow, but as always, I went very slowly. I kept my eyes glued to the depth and I managed to get over the lip and eventually anchored right up in the corner of this beautiful little spot with about two meters of water under the keel in crystal clear sandy water right in between all the coral. Just such a beautiful way to end the day. Dan and I realized that we could go out on the spit and because the wind was blowing so hard outside we were able to have an amazing evening of kiting. The sunset was beautiful, there were mountains in the background, it was gorgeous flat water and just the perfect end to a really chill day with just the one blip of stress of getting over the lip. We stayed in that lagoon for a couple days just kind of hanging out and enjoying not being near any villages and just having a little bit of time to ourselves before we decided it was time to move on again. This time, very exciting, Dan had a couple days off from work so him and I decided to do a sail together and meet Uhuru in the next anchorage. We just sailed 20 miles down the lagoon to the next anchorage and I pretty much exclusively use satellite charts here because you can't trust Navionics at all. They don't show any of the reefs or the bombies and they're not accurate. <laughs> but unfortunately here the satellite charts uh, have a giant hole in them. So I'm going to send Dan up the mast in the bosun's chair with a radio and he's going to sort of guide the geck into the anchorage uh, from his vantage point aloft. This is where we're going, and it just, I mean, it's even showing the past as being reefed, so, and this is all uncharted, charted, uh, yeah, so you can see it's useless. And then the sat charts are good for the beginning part of the pass, and then they also disappear, and we're trying to get into here, uh, so that's kind of the situation. So Dan is um, up on the spreaders. He's gonna be telling me where to go. And I'm down here. He's got the handheld and I've got the boat VHF on. <laughs> we just did a giant circle while I was pulling him up, which is fun and exciting. There he is. Looks like there's a resort here. Maybe we should try and go up the dunes. That would be awesome. <laughs> See the channel marker ahead? Um, yeah, I think I want to keep that to port. I'd uh, kick that to your starboard. To starboard? Okay. If you go 5, 10 degrees to port now, that's a good heading, stay there. We proceeded like this with Dan giving me directions from aloft and me slowly navigating in. At times it was pretty scary because we had to pass over some really shallow patches which was hard for Dan to gauge how deep it was so I would just crawl forward going from neutral to idle forward and watching the depth. The lowest <laughs> depth that we saw was about three feet of water under the keel as we passed over just, it was just like a range of coral that we couldn't go around otherwise. Definitely an exercise in trust but finally, after half an hour of very slow moving, we got into the anchorage, which was wide open and super easy to anchor. Um, it was just another one of those classic Solomon Islands coral lips. <laughs> We heard there was a manta ray cleaning station somewhere near where our boats were, so we hired a local fisherman to take us out at sunrise the next morning. Everyone's 
We always like to try to support the locals in every place we visit in any way possible, and one of the easy ways is to hire them to take us around in the boat to different snorkeling locations. We can, of course, do it with our own dinghies, but it's just a nice way to give back to the community. Uh, it was not necessarily a successful mission for Mantis, but we definitely had a time. <laughs> After we gave up on seeing a manta ray in this particular anchorage, we asked our driver to take us to the pass and just drop us off for a drift snorkel. It was super beautiful and definitely made the whole thing worthwhile. Dan still has a couple days off, so him and I are taking off now for an overnight sail to the island right next to Gizo Island. It's by Sanbis Resort, and it's supposed to be a very safe anchorage because the resort has their own security and they kind of control the waters around the area. Gizo itself has a pretty sketchy reputation, and it's only three or four miles from here, but it's around the corner and apparently it's okay. We checked with the resort owner first to make sure it was a safe place to anchor, and then Dan and I took off for our first overnight passage ever together. Yeah, I think they're little guys. Yeah, but... Ooh, I don't know. Dan and I had been underway for a couple hours, and we were doing the usual gecko sail watches where you lie in the cockpit and sort of pay attention, but kind of not. Um, just a little glance around every now and then to see if there's ships, when I looked up and realized that we were about 20 meters from running into something. I wasn't quite sure what it was uh, until later. I realized these are fads, like these huge bamboo constructed fishing devices that usually have no lights on them, no satellite beacons at all. Um, they're super hard to see, you're almost on top of them because they're very low to the water. And we started seeing one of these every couple miles. We were eight miles offshore in hundreds of meters of water and we started to get a little bit nervous because we knew the sun was setting and once it was dark we weren't going to be able to see them at all. Um, so we decided to turn a little bit further offshore just to try to get out of the line of these things, but pretty scary stuff. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, sun's going down and it's time for the eveningly uh, shower. So normally when I do this, I throw a bucket and take a shower in the cockpit, but because now we're two people, uh, we've put a line behind the boat and we're just, we're going about four and a half knots. So we're just dragging behind the boat to wash ourselves off. Super fun. I've never done this on the Gek before. I only do it, um, wait. <laughs> Don't tell me that I think you're a great time to see this. 
said, Charles said, smiling. Baby friends and curling. They are war secrets, sir. I said, they couldn't help an enemy. These are secrets are going to help all of mankind. The teller's done, said Charles said, lighting it. So we're coming into the lagoon now. We haven't yet had a drop of rain the entire 30 hours that we've been out, which is so unusual and lovely. And it's just really pretty. We both wish that there was kite wind because this is the perfect kite spot. Uh, but we are going to have our first stint in civilization since we got to the Solomons. There's a resort here. We're going to go out for dinner. Wood-fired pizza. What? What? So just kind of excited to be a tourist for the day. That's pretty much it. Really pretty. Resort was maybe a little bit of a stretch for Sanbis, but it was a really beautiful little restaurant um, with a little bit of a dock that went out over the water. Dan and I went there and we had some drinks, we had some pizza, and it was our first time really not being in a little sandy village. They had sunk in this old boat just offshore the from the resort and that it was a like a free dive playground. It was only in about 10 meters of water, so we went down to swim around in it and explore the next day. Thank you guys for watching this week's video. I put out new videos on YouTube every two weeks and for my patrons, you guys get a snack on the weeks that I don't put out a full length YouTube. Thank you so much to all of my patrons who are supporting me and making this venture possible. Uh, if you'd like to become a patron, my Patreon is patreon.com slash and my patrons get access to exclusive videos um, documenting either real-time updates because my footage lags behind or specific things that they want to see about how I do stuff on my boat, specific questions that they have. Um, we have a lot of fun on there, so join up on that for as little as a dollar a month if you want to just get a little bit of extra uh, or help to support me. Also, I have a PayPal, paypal.me slash windhippie um, for one-time donations. Today should have been shower day, side note. Um, <laughs> thank you 
you guys for all of your lovely comments uh, and thank you for subscribing. It helps me get my name out there and helps me get more views uh, when you subscribe. Thank you Tish for helping me remember when I need to do another edit, getting them up on YouTube for me. Uh, right now I'm editing on my boat in Townsville Marina um, while I'm doing a series of refits on the boat. Uh, so that's fun. And I have merchandise, uh, everything in the links below if you want to look at that. I think that is all for now. Uh, patrons, I'll see you next week with a snack. And YouTube people, I'll see you in another two weeks. A cool piece of World War II history in Gizo is the story of Kennedy Island. And I actually sailed past this island to get into the lagoon. And it's so unassuming, I didn't even know that it had a history until a couple days later when I was chatting with some people about the area. Uh, so what happened was, on August 2nd, 1943, a Japanese destroyer sunk the patrol boat Rendova just outside of Gizo. The attack cut the PT boat in half and killed two of the 13 crewmen. In command of the boat that night was a young John F. Kennedy, only 24 years old. Two of his fellow crewmen were injured, and Kennedy towed one of them to safety on what was then called Caslow Island. Kennedy accomplished the swim of over three miles by clenching the man's life vest strap in his teeth, leaving his own arms free for swimming. Kennedy Island would be the crew's home base for the next few days. Kennedy and his crew members made forays by swimming to nearby islands hoping to find fresh water and a closer location to Ferguson Passage through which American PT boats passed. They're looking for a rescue. On August 5th, Kennedy encountered two Solomon Islanders, Biuku Gaza and Ironi Kumana. They were island scouts for the Allies. Kennedy's crew finally convinced them that the stranded men were American. On the next day, August 6th, Kennedy scratched a message asking for help into the husk of a green coconut and the two Solomon Islanders left with it in search of assistance. Finally, on August 8th, the surviving crew of PT-109 was rescued under Kennedy's direction. Super cool story. Everyone's really stoked about that history in the area. And the night that Dan and I went out to the little resort um, for drinks and pizza, we met uh, some Australian tourists who had come to that area specifically to go to the island um, and see more about the history of the place.